GROW stand for and, and you know, what's your mission with the GROW program? Mm -hmm. The GROW program stands for Gang Realities in Our World and it's a unit where we have a bunch of diverse gangs together all in one complex, one unit, living together, working towards the same mission to basically it's a program that focuses on gang interventions. Um, there's a lot of different sessions that go on in that group but the basic thing is to work on um, getting them out of the gang or to learn about what it is to be in a gang and the negative aspects of it. So what amazes me about that is you're basically talking about, we'll just use two gangs that are, you know, everybody would know by name, uh -huh. the Bloods and the Crips. Uh -huh. So in other words, you'd be taking two, if two kids came in, came in one was from the Bloods mm -hmm. and one was from the Crips, you'd be putting them in the same housing unit together. Yeah, they live together, they do the groups together, they um, spend their free time together all in the same same unit, living together, working towards that same mission. And it would almost seem to be that most people would think, well that's counterintuitive, you would never put two rival gang members together. Mm -hmm. What's the theory behind why that might work? Well of course at the beginning we were a little nervous about it because we didn't know how that program would be having all those kids together, but what we have found is that they do a lot better being together. Um, they kind of police themselves and they uh, do the program and they work on their groups and they interact together. So have there been any instances where you know there's just no way that, I mean you probably have to take them on an individual basis to kind of watch mm -hmm. certain kids when they first come in or do you just pretty much assume hey we're gonna put you together and you're gonna figure this out? Well, the offenders that are in that group have been identified security threat group members. So they have to be identified to participate in that group. Um, we also have some of the other offenders we, that have identified, we have identified them upon intake. And um, if they have caused problems at other facilities or maybe they have a history of being involved in gangs, then we place them in that program. Or another referral process would be the offenders that are out in general population that are participating in activities that have to do with gangs. Maybe they have a lot of gang literature. Maybe they've, um, you know, participated in batteries on other offenders or fights because of gang, because of gang activity. Then those offenders are also placed in that program. But we're getting to the point to where we are placing every offender that is a serious security threat group member that has been identified to participate in the GROW program. Is this unprecedented? Are there other programs like this around the country? Um, we were actually pretty, we had a great opportunity to be able to develop, implement, and pilot the first gang intervention program for juveniles, at least in the state of Indiana. But from what I understand, there's not too many other programs in the United States that focus directly on gang intervention. So what has the feedback been from the kids? Are you getting some feedback? Yeah, um, a lot of the kids are really you know, buying into the program and are really doing doing really well. And um, they've been interviewed, you know, we go through release arc and we see some of those kids and um, what we have noticed is that when they first come into the program, uh, they're, the, how, you know, it's so new that we haven't been able to do a lot of statistics for the program yet, but one thing we have been able to do is measure the amount of conduct reports and, and gang activity that they were in before the program after they complete the program, then the number of conduct reports and incidents in that gang activity has gone down. Do they also find, is there a theory behind it also that if they learn to live side by side mm -hmm. in a correctional facility, then when they go back out into the community, they'll be able to live side by side with you know who they thought were their rivals when they were on the outs? Um, you know the hope is for the program that they will get out of the game and not be a part of that activity. You know we know that we can't change everyone and that everybody isn't going to be out of the gang but we hope that some of those offenders will get out and learn that there's better things in life than being a part of a gang because if you talk to the kids a lot of them will say there's only two things that will happen to me if I'm if I stay in this gang and that's either death or prison. Really? Mm -hmm. So how, what, what comes out during group sessions with these kids? What are some of the things that you hear? What do they say? What, what, what have you found fascinating about the kids in this program? Um, 
Well, some of the things that they talk about, obviously, is their family and their life and the way that they were raised. Um, they talk about the victims. That's, that's a huge part of it, is being able to identify what it's like to be a victim in an instance where they've, been, they've participated in an activity. So what do you find is at the core of these kids? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. are the kids in the GROW program, I would imagine each kid that's in a separate program here, some might be in, you know, the gang-related program, some mm -hmm. might be in the sex offender program. Do you see a, a distinctive difference between one kid that comes in with one problem and one that comes with another? Or can you differentiate it all? Um, well, of course, they're all individualized, and their treatment programs are set up to be individualized. So... Yeah, I mean, everybody's different, but they all are trying to work towards the same thing. That's to change, you know, their lives. I'm sure a lot of people would ask, oh, my gosh, what's the job of a program director like at a maximum security juvenile correctional facility? <laughs> Pendleton has the toughest kids, mm -hmm. kids that maybe other facilities can't handle. Um, I think you guys sort of pride yourself on the fact that you have programs in place. Mm -hmm. So this, talk to me about the fact that this isn't just a place with barbed wire fence mm -hmm. housing kids indefinitely. Tell me about your goals as program director for the kids who are here. Well, of course, we have a lot of different programs that we provide here. Um, and a lot of them are specialized, you know, such as the GROW program. We have the intensive treatment unit here, which has you know, low-functioning psychi psychiatric offenders in that unit. We have the, uh, the 18 and over kids for two units of 18 and over. Then we have the regular general population offenders. And then we have the STEP program, which is our sex offender treatment and education program. And then we also have our segregation unit. And we have a, what you would call a long-term segregation unit, which is our impact unit. And Ted, and sorry, yeah. intense management program affecting change and treatment. And we focus on those kids are the kids that have been the most violent and aggressive kids in the facility or uh, have numerous escape attempts or a successful escape attempt that have, are in that program. And in that program, we focus on trying to get them to get back out to the general population so that they can finish the rest of their program. We also provide anger management, ART, anger replacement therapy. We have substance abuse, which is staying sharp as our substance abuse group. And then we also do thinking for a change. It's a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of love. So right. you've identified these are the main areas that where kids need the most help. Mm -hmm. So t tell me about the sex offender programs and mm -hmm. the unique challenges of kids who come in as sex offenders. Because I, I know all of us the other day, you know, saw a boy about this high yeah. running around 12 years old. And mm -hmm. most people, I think, could never imagine that a child that young could be someplace like this for a sex offense. Tell oh, those yeah. Kids. We house those kids. We have 96 kids that are in our sex offender treatment and education program. And we house them based upon their, their age and their risk levels. So we have one unit that is uh, all kids that are under 16 years old. So if you, you know, and what we have found is that a lot of those kids in that unit now are coming, they're coming upon intake being the ages of 12 and 13 and 14 years old. Um, we have a unit that's a high risk unit for sex offenders. We have a medium risk and then a low risk unit. So for people who might not understand exactly what some of the offenses are for sex mm -hmm. offenders. Th these are kids who come in, they've had actual, vic they've actually victimized others. Yes, we have child, mol child molesters. We have um, child molesting, of course, would be one of the charges. Sexual batteries, um, you know, those are the two main ones that, that we normally have is the child molesting and the sexual battery. Do you find that the kids who are in that program, um, and I don't know if this is something that comes to your attention or not, I'm mm -hmm. guessing it does, that maybe they had a history themselves of, of abuse or neglect as children, because I, mm -hmm. I know just from you know, some of the work I've done in the past, yeah. they seem to replicate sometimes what's happened to them. Some of them do, but you would be surprised that, that not all of them do, because most people would think that Obviously, they, you would have to have seen that to, to perform those activities, but in a lot of cases, that's not, that's not it. Really? Mm -hmm. And you talked about anger management, which mm -hmm. also, um, we've had so many kids, not just in this facility, but you know, around the country tell us, you know, I just 
I've always had such anger. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you try and turn that around? You know, that's a challenge trying to find programs, I would imagine, that can try and turn around years and years and years of anger. Mm -hmm. Well, the group that we do, the anger replacement therapy, has three different parts to it. And it's the anger cycle, moral development, and social skills. So we're kind of hitting everything all into one group. And, um, you know, that, of course, in that group, they do role play activities. They do all different kinds of homework assignments, journaling, and dis group discussions while they're in that group about trying to get them to understand the importance of learning ways to control your anger. Tell me how the kids <clears throat> typically interact with each other, say during group. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do they find solace of some sort in, you know, being able to understand that they're not the only ones with kind of the same issues? Tell me about the, the interaction between the kids. Um, usually during groups, I mean, they have really good group discussions where they're able to talk about things and especially their family life or, or back in their environment and what has caused them to be so angry because a lot of times there's something there that's made them so angry whether it's abuse, whether it's neglect, whether it's something that's happened in their past that they've seen um, could be something that has to do with post-traumatic stress syndrome that they've seen early in their life and now they're trying to deal with it in the, in the wrong way so a lot of them seem to, you know, form together and they interact in groups and they participate. And we see, we see, we hope that the groups, you know, actually do make an impact on them. So what is the um, typical length of time that a, a, an offender um, will be here at Pendleton? And, uh, let's use the GROW program, for example. Mm -hmm. How is it they, that they graduate out of the GROW program. Today we actually saw someone from the GROW program, two people mm -hmm. I believe graduate, but how long does that take? What do they need to do? What steps do they need to complete in mm -hmm. order to actually graduate? Well, in the GROW program, the main goal is to get them to complete the group and then go back out to general population to finish the rest of their needs because while they're in the GROW program, what they focus on is just their gang, just the, the gang intervention. Um, they may ha still have other needs that they need to finish working on, whether it be substance abuse or anger management, and they'll finish those, those goals out in general population. But we do have some kids that have gone over there on a higher level who will be transitioning out to the community, you know, and so we have really tried to work hard to set those offenders up with uh, mentors and role models and people outside of the facility to help them once they get out as you know to have a successful re-entry into society. Because it seems to me the challenge would be you can do all this great work here and you can help them get their education and mm -hmm. give them counseling and they do everything right and then they go back into the very community mm -hmm. where the temptations were to begin with. How, right. do you, how do you deal with that? And a lot of times that's that's exactly the case. Um, you know, occasionally you'll have those families that will move and that will actually try to move out of those communities to try to help, you know, their, their child to have a better life and to, to get out of that. But most of the time they're going back to the same communities and that's where we have to teach our, those skills that, that they can learn to help them once they get out into society and to help them with the reentry process. Do the families actually come in and participate in programming with the kids? Yeah, we have a lot of ki uh, families that do participate. We have family sessions. They can come in for treatment teams. We have a lot of opportunities for visits, phone calls, case conferences, things like that. And I take it there's some kids that get visits and phone calls. <laughs> Tell me about that dynamic. Yeah, um, of course. There are some offenders that get visits regularly, weekly. Um, those families might attend treatment teams, might come to family sessions once a month, but then you will also have those offenders that will see their family or talk to their family the entire time they're here. And that's always a challenging case because it's hard to get things set up for them in the community when you haven't spoken to the family or been able to, you know, help them. I know it was sad today when, mm -hmm. when Charles Taylor was, you know, so looking forward to his mom being at graduation and then uh -huh. for whatever circumstances wasn't here. Do you also find that it's a challenge because now he's disappointed. So mm -hmm. he, he's already, if she does show up to pick him up, which we're all <laughs> hoping she does. Yeah. Um, but it, do you, do you somewhat try and help prepare them for disappointments mm -hmm. because 
you obviously know that things like that can happen. And do. Right, and and for the most part, we know which which families that that that's going to happen to, and and of course, it's the families that haven't participated and haven't been a part of their lives while they've been here. So we do have to help prepare them. Uh, for that, you know, of course, you don't want that to happen for anybody on the day of release, and then their parent not show up. That's, you know, that's that's a sad thing for them, and it, and it's hard for them. But we will do the best we can. I mean, if we have to, we would transport the offender home and make sure that the parent was there. So ultimately, um, what's your personal and professional hope for these kids because you see a <laughs> lot of kids come and go. Mm -hmm. You see some kids make it and you see some recidivism mm -hmm. rates. Um, you know, what is your ultimate goal and how hard is it not to get attached to mm -hmm. some of the kids that you're with for so long? Oh, it is very hard because some of these offenders, you know, that you might have worked with for several years before, you know, you, you see them and they come and go and they come and go. And, you know, I had a personal experience with one offender that, um, that I, you know, I had worked with for several years and, you know, come to find out after he had been here so many times, he ended up, you know, getting waved to a dock court. So, of course, that, that's, you know, you take that personal, but you can't. I mean, you know, you can't change everybody that, that is here, obviously. But I always look at it as if you can help one person, then you've done your job. <laughs> I know. I was like, I didn't want to get on that subject too much. But. No, but I didn't. I didn't. It was sounded like. I, I, it just, okay, I'll, I'll ask it again that way. Darkwing Duck to you? Darkwing Duck. <laughs> <laughs> Who I did or she did? <laughs> I was trying to think of a positive way to say that without, you know. I what you're talking about. I was trying to think of a good way to say that too to make it sound right no, rather no. than saying, you know, I really screwed up or, no, you know, no, no, something. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I was trying to think of, I'm trying to think of what also coming up, what we're going to be filming so I can get um, uh, maybe the STEP program. We'll talk a little bit about the that. The sex offender program? Yeah. Well, you talked about yeah, that. Yeah, I talked uh, about that. Um, you know what? I did forget plus unit when I was talking about it, the units. Unit? Okay, I'll well, that. when I forgot to say that when I talked about all the different programs. So okay, that's okay. I don't know. <laughs> you won't have all that in there anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, but don't ask me too many questions about that. Okay. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know a lot about um, I'll be like, uh, right. Karen. <laughs> um, I feel like I've missed. How do you like songs, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I do like the meatloaf sandwich at Psalms. I've never had the meatloaf sandwich at Psalms, but I do like Psalms. <laughs> well, um, you know, earlier we were talking about an offender who was here before, you know, Zachary Hurd. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that you feel the public maybe doesn't know about kids who are in a facility like this? Mm -hmm. um, sort of the misperception of of who these kids are mm -hmm. and, and what they're like. Um, because I know what the kids tell us. Yeah. You know, we're not all bad. Everybody thinks we're just nothing mm -hmm. but bad, rotten kids. So what do you think it is that the public doesn't know about this group of kids? I think that the biggest perception that, of course, we would want the public to understand is that they are kids. So, you know, even though they do commit crimes, and some of them are violent and some of them are aggressive, um, but they still are kids, so there still are those things that they will need, you know. They still need that attention. They still need those things that you would think a normal kid would need, you know, a family, a home, people that do care about them and do want to see them succeed instead of just thinking that they all aren't going to succeed. So why is it important that people actually get involved with at-risk youth on the outside? Because... Mm -hmm. I think our hope is is that we can somehow all try and identify these kids before they get to this point. So what is it that people out there could do, do you think, personally, that could prevent them from finding themselves here to begin with? Well, um, it's a very rewarding job, 
you know, working in a place like this because you do see those positive changes that those kids do make. Um, I think just being an active part of their lives in the community, whether it's family, whether it's friends, you know, whatever it is, it's being a part of their lives and actually caring what happens to them and trying to be a part.